Good morning, everybody, and thanks very much to, to Marta, Mounning and, and Ryan for in, inviting me to be part of this session. I also want to express special thanks to my Tasmanian in-laws who, who have turned up to, to boost the numbers somewhat this morning. If you, if you think it's looking a bit crowded in here, then that's, that's why. Okay, I'm going to start off by trying to reduce the multi-dimensional complexity of the challenge we're dealing with this week down to a simple two-dimensional diagram. And what I've got here is, is space reduced to a, a single dimension. Just imagine a, a transect across the landscape. Um, then we have an environmental variable or gradient as the y-axis here. Think of, for example, temperature. And then just think about the different lines in this, in this diagram representing um, dif different times. And so you've got the environment changing with, with climate change over time. And if we think of that very simple representation, then it's an easy way to distinguish between sort of two broad approaches that are really dominating the work in, in this field and, and that we're hearing a lot about this week. And the, the first of these approaches is one that involves explicitly modelling changes in the distribution of individual um, biological entities, usually species, but also things like, like community types. And so this, you know, as you've heard many times this week and we'll hear more of, involves essentially um, using information on the present day niche of, of, of a species or a community type to then make projections about what might happen um, to the distribution of that species as the climate changes. And I won't say any more about that because everyone else is talking about it all week. But of course there's another major approach that, that's out there which I think people are talking about a bit this week and this is one where you, people really focus on rather than trying to explicitly model what's happening to particular entities of biodiversity. They're instead working purely with um, spatio-temporal patterns in, in climate itself. And, and, and the arguments for, for this approach normally go along the lines of, you know, there are lots of places in the world and lots of biological groups where we really don't have the species level understanding to, to model what's going to happen to every individual species that's out there. So the idea is to, to instead just work directly with um, spatio-temporal patterns in, in climate itself. And so that, that leads to simple measures of, of local climate change or, or stability, um, the, the velocity of, of, of climate change, which is, I think, being talked about a lot this week, and also other, other kinds of measures that some of you would have seen um, novel environments or climates and also disappearing environments. So, so this, this is certainly a, a, a very effective means of, of dealing with potential impacts of climate change for, for places, often very diverse parts of, of the world, um, for which we really don't have the information on individual species to, to model at, at the species level. Okay, now, this is all very well, but there are some assumptions with, with underpinning this approach. And probably the biggest assumption of all is, is the one that, um, that a reasonable correlation exists between changes in environment and, and changes in the, the biota. And one way of thinking of this is that if we have an, an environmental gradient and we can also imagine a gradient of biological composition, then what's being assumed is that, is that a fixed amount of change in environment will result in roughly the same amount of, of biological change or change in bio community composition um, no matter where you are in the world. But if you stop and think for very long about how the world actually operates, then it's not, doesn't take long to realise that this assumption really doesn't hold in many situations. So we know that, for example, with many environmental gradients, that 
the amount of biological change that you get um, for a given change in that environmental gradient can, can vary enormously along that, that gradient. And the example I often like to give here is in an Australian context is mean annual precipitation. Imagine a, a 300 millimetre difference in mean annual precipitation. If, if that 300 millimetre difference is between you know, a, a site that has 200 millimetres versus 500 millimetres, then the biological composition of those two sites will have virtually nothing in common for most biological groups. They will be completely different systems. But if you go to the other end of the scale and imagine two sites, one that's 2,700 millimetres per annum and the other's 3,000 millimetres per annum, then most biologists and ecologists going and looking at those two sites will not, will not be able to tell the difference between them. They're, they're virtually identical. So it matters where you are on the environmental gradient. It, it also matters what biological group you're, you're thinking about and what the, the dispersal ability of, of, of that group is and therefore how, how rapidly species replace each other as you move along an environmental gradient. And it also matters what region you're in and what, what the biogeographic history of that region is. Is it a region that's been stable, stable climatically for very long periods? and therefore you've got you know, relatively narrow niches, high niche packing, or is it a, an environment that's been very unstable for long periods and therefore you tend to have wider niches. And then the final complication is that um, you, can, you, you will rarely have a situation where, where change in the biota is determined purely by one environmental gradient. There's normally several environmental gradients that are driving biological change. So that brings us to this idea of bioclimatic scaling, which is simply the notion of using best available location records for, for all species in a group of interest and in a region of interest, combining that with, with present day climatic surfaces to, to actually scale um, these environmental gradients that, that we're working with. So to, to let masses of biological data tell us how to scale that multidimensional environmental space in a way where distances within that space better match um, turnover in biological composition. And There are various statistical techniques that can be used to fit these models. The, the, the technique of choice in our group is something called generalised dissimilarity modelling that we developed many years ago now. And it's just essentially a way of, of combining best available biological data for a group, in this case masses of records for, for a large number of land snail species, combining that with, um, with environmental present day environmental layers to fit a model that, as I said, will transform that multidimensional environmental space, essentially warp it, so that the distances within that space now better match um, compositional differences in the biota. And just in passing, I'll mention that our team has just completed fitting these sorts of models now to, to, to global biological and environmental data sets and to cut a long story short, we now have these, these sorts of bio, bioclimatically scaled models derived um, for the whole planet using um, hundreds of, of millions of filtered name match records for around about 400,000 species of plants, invertebrates and, and vertebrates. So what, what does this allow? Um, basically, it, it puts us in a position where, where we can not only look at future projections of climate change and interpret what they will mean in terms of the change in, in composition for a site of interest, site I, in this case, the, the red site, um, but we can also do that by looking at the site of interest now relative to another site in the future. And so that means that on this diagram, that the shades of green here represent varying levels of, of 
of comp pre pre predicted compositional similarity, or the other way of thinking of it is that it's, um, it's bi bioclimatically scaled climatic difference between those, those locations. So I'll, I'm starting to run out of time. Is that five minutes, Marta? Really? Okay. I'll, I'll go quickly then. Let's, let's jump to some, some examples. This, this bioclimatic scaling allows us to then basically implement all of those other measures that I mentioned earlier, velocity of climate change, novel and disappearing climates, in this case for some work in Queensland some years ago, but now based on the, the bioclimatically scaled climate space in a multidimensional climate space rather than doing it with a single variable. Then if we look at now working backwards, looking from the future environment back to the present environment, we can derive things like um, layers of refugial potential indicating places in the landscape that um, are likely to be important for, for, for biodiversity as the climate changes, places that will have an environment that is actually disappearing um, in the future. Then we can do things like um, provide advice to, to natural resource managers, um, in this case, um, in terms of priorities for where to revegetate to best counter the effects of climate change. And Kristen Williams is talking about that in this session at, at 5 p.m. today. I'll leave that to her to talk about. And just very quickly, an example of where this whole approach has been integrated into a very big multi-sector integrated assessment model recently, and this work made the cover of, of Nature a couple of months ago, and, and this was basically looking at evaluating um, alternative policy options, balancing sustainability and economic growth at a national level. Just to, to finish off, um, just to mention some of the ways that we're now extending this, this fairly basic approach, um, a lot of attention is going into better considering ecological processes, things like dispersal, species assemblage, uh, species assembly, um, evolutionary adaptation, but I won't say anything about that because Karel McCarney is talking today on some of that work and, and Alex Bush is, is talking tomorrow on other aspects of that. And then um, another example that was going to be presented at this confer conference is the the application of these techniques to, to genetic data, um, and this was, was Matt Fitzpatrick was going to be presenting here. Unfortunately, he had to withdraw from, from the conference, but this, this same analytical framework can, can be applied to, to, to adaptive genetic variation and looking at what the consequences are of that under climate change. And a final example there of some of the extensions um, is a growing interest in fitting these models not just to spatial data and then, then doing space for time substitutions to project into the future, but also looking at fitting models to temporal data. And in this case, work with Jessica Blois and others, where we're actually using fossil pollen data from North America over 20,000 years, both to, to fit um, temporal um, bioclimatically scaled models, as well as using this time series to evaluate the performance of space for time substitution when you do fit models at one point in time and project them over other time periods. So, so in conclusion, just, just very quickly, the messages I want to give you are that bio, bioclimatic scaling does offer what I think of as the third major analytical option for assessing and addressing climate change impacts on biodiversity. In a sense, it occupies the middle ground between the explicit modelling of shifts in biological distributions and analyses based purely on spatiotemporal patterns in climate alone. It makes very effective use of best available biological data for highly diverse, lesser studied biological groups and, and regions, and, and finally, as hopefully you've, um, you've seen from the examples I've shown, it provides the foundation for a rich array of analyses of potential impacts and options for policy and management. Thank you.